Hello. Uh, my name is Seth Manukin. Um, I am the director of the communications forum. Hey, Jill. Uh, and um, hi, students. Uh, I, I'm not going to actually say hello individually to everyone I know in the crowd, but it's delightful to see you all. Um, uh, and I am thrilled to uh, welcome Sarah Vowell here. Um, before we start, uh, we will post a video of this um, online, so please do not take pictures or videos um, or record this while you're here. Just enjoy being here, uh, and you can relive it later if you want. Um, Sarah Vowell is a historian, author, uh, and radio personality. She's written seven, is that right, nonfiction books, um, many of which have been New York Times bestsellers. They have covered everything from cranky cartographers and religious zealots to overthrown Hawaiian queens and presidential assassins, uh, and they seek to explore America's past in a way that create a framework for understanding our modern day values. She is a contributing editor for This American Life. Um, nope, she is not a contributing editor for This American Life. Uh, and she's written for a whole mess of places. Um, you might recognize her voice from Violet in The Incredibles or next year, right? 2018? Incredibles 2. Incredibles 2. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and, uh, and I would also like to thank the DeFlores Fund for Humor um, for sponsoring tonight's talk and, uh, and allowing us to bring Sarah here. Uh, the way this will work is the way all conforms work. Um, Sarah and I will talk for a while, and then we will do uh, Q&A for a while. Um, we are also selling books in the back, and there will be a book signing um, uh, afterwards. It will take place up here, I believe. So uh, the Red Sox are losing five to two. Yes, I know. I apologize for that. Wait, what? <laughs> um, OK, so how are you? Hi. <laughs> Good to see you. Uh-huh. Um, we, yeah, we, when was the last, the last time we saw each other was when you were on Maybe tour Maybe a couple for of years ago. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Feedback? I guess. Um, so I wanted to um, start by talking about uh, how you got started, your, your career. OK. Um, we both, I, I think. I just asked, when Seth poured me this water, I just asked if it's still water because I once. Oh, this is a story you said you're not going to tell me until we. Yeah, because I this let this be a lesson to you if you're doing public speaking. But I used to put on a lot of uh, events in New York City, like benefits and stuff. And one of them was where uh, Steve Buscemi was supposed to read a bunch of short stories. And um, I only provided sparkling water in backstage. And he drank a bunch of it, and he burped through the whole evening. <laughs> and he kept burping through this Tobias Wolf story and blaming me. So I, that's why I was just checking, because you know, I, that live and learn. I feel like, I feel like if, you've lear if you go away tonight having learned anything, that would be the most valuable thing, well, is I don't, stay away from carbonation and I, public speaking. I don't want to excuse your behavior uh -huh. in any way, but I do feel like at that point in his career, Steve should have known his own body well enough to... He didn't. Right. Maybe he thought that was, it, was, it would add dramatic effect. I did. OK. Um, so... Uh, what was your question? You started out writing about music. Seth and I, can I just say first, uh -oh. Seth and I have known each other a long time. So I don't remember when I stopped being nice to you, but that ship has it was, sailed. It was a long time yeah. ago. <laughs> Uh, so I, I want you to know that I'm generally a nice person, just not to him. Yeah. <laughs> what, go ahead. What was your question again? Um, uh, so hi. Hi. <laughs> um, you started out writing about music. True or false? Sort of. I mean, that's definitely, I made, made part of my living doing that in the 90s. I, I really started as a writer writing about art, visual art, because that's what I studied in school. And I started uh, writing for my college paper about art. And then I wrote for some art magazines right out of college. And uh, then I uh, quickly started writing for weekly newspapers. Um, do they still Our have those? Our audience might not know yeah. what weekly newspapers yeah. are. Um, 
So I, I wrote for the Minneapolis City Pages, the Chicago Reader, the San Francisco Weekly, and eventually the Village Voice, and then I, I was writing about music for those places. And so did you know, uh, before you got out of college, that you wanted to be a writer? I did, but I didn't know any writers, so I didn't know that that was necessarily possible. So um, I kept with, I, I just thought I would be an art history professor who wrote on the side. And then when I was in graduate school for art history, they made us teach freshman art history, which is what you do when you become an art history professor. And I did not enjoy that experience, um, <laughs> trying to you know, talk to 18-year-olds about Vermeer and whatnot. And uh, I thought, that's no way to live a life. <laughs> Talking to 18-year-olds yeah. about Vermeer. Yeah. And um, and then uh, by that point in in school, I was I was kind of already out of that. I mean, I was already writing my first book, which was about radio and writing uh, for the papers and stuff while I was in art history graduate school. So I was just kind of I think I did art history graduate school because I was afraid to be an adult. But I'm sure those of you who are in graduate school. <laughs> that you have better reasons than me. And probably for some of these engineering type things, I think for those of us who, you know, drive on bridges and stuff, we want you to have as much education as possible. <laughs> in the liberal arts sometimes, you know. I, I, you're not at risk. MIT is known for many things, but its art history graduate program is not one of them. So yeah, you're not at huge that's, risk that's of offending true. a large okay. segment of the I mean, audience. I did learn. I'd still like, I basically think I write like an art historian in a lot of ways because, I mean, the prime thing you do uh, is uh, the compare and contrast, you know. And that's actually how I started writing and started thinking my, of myself as a writer was um, taking essay exams in art history and um, I remember once in undergraduate school doing an essay exam about uh, Greek and Etruscan art. And I remember writing my blue book and something made me laugh and I started laughing in the middle of this exam. And I remember everyone like looking over at me like, this is not supposed to be fun. <laughs> or, I was, I was writing this. Uh, or like, has she cracked up? Yeah, or... or I remember writing, I was in, I went to the Netherlands to do a project on Dutch modernism. And uh, I remember when I, read, I was supposed to be finished with my uh, paper and my boyfriend at the time was waiting for me to finish because then we were going to backpack around Europe. So he's just standing there waiting for me to finish. And he's outside the door and he hears me giggling because I'm some, something is making me laugh about writing about red, yellow, and blue paintings. And he comes in and he's kind of irked because we we're supposed to leave already. But he's like, wow, you sure enjoy writing those papers. And that was the moment I thought, I sure do. You know? So when, so. And also, if you ever have to write a 40 page paper about red, yellow, and blue squares, you can kind of write anything. You know. So were you laughing? At, were you laughing at your own quip, or were you laughing because there was some absurd? I don't. I think. I, I think I was specific. So there was this one guy, and he was Hungarian, and he was hanging Wait, out in Holland. There was this one guy. There was this one guy, and he was Hungarian. Not in the exam room. No. You moved beyond the in exam the room. Dutch okay. modernist movement of the style. Okay. And um, he, his big innovation, so they would, some of them were painters, but some of them made environments, which were like rooms, basically. And his big innovation was there was a corner, and he continued his rectangular, his rectangle of like red, yellow, or blue, those were the only allowed colors. Um, across a corner, and it blew everyone's mind. <laughs> For some reason, that always cracked so he, me he up. So he took the color past a right angle. It's like the... he 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 had the rectangle, but then it was you know it was like the corner of a room, and so the rectangle continued right. across the corner, and everyone just thought like, what an innovation, and it, you know. And now known as that Hungarian guy. <laughs> yeah, his name was Vilmos Hujar. Oh, I was going to say, do yeah. you remember who it is? Totally, wow. I All do. Right. Yeah. And so. Uh, I can teach this stuff. I just wouldn't want to. Choose not to. Yeah. Right. So, so how did you go? I don't know how you put up with it. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes the teenagers are 
I mean, maybe here they're all excited to be here. The teenagers? <laughs> yeah, but I remember at one point when we got to the um, 60s and the performance era, I do remember I did this thing where I had this huge rope, this really long rope, and I don't remember what point I was making, but I tied them all to each other. Wait, this is a class you're yes. teaching as a graduate student? Yes, I'm just I tied, to, I tied them all up we with a rope. You were in a hotel room with your oh, boyfriend. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I tied the students up with a rope and, and left. As one and does. left. <laughs> <laughs> and I never came back. How, <laughs> how are your evaluations that semester? I mean, they were uneven. Okay. <laughs> Some appreciated it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it seems like you did have a fair amount of fun teaching. Oh, I should yeah. try that tactic with my students. Mm -hmm. Students. Um, uh, so how did you go from? Because your first book was about listening to the radio. Uh huh. So how did you go from Which rectangles of color recommend. traversing walls to listening to the radio for a year and writing about well, it? Well. Um, I went from writing the papers and doing the essay exams to writing for the school paper about art. And then um, uh, out of school, I wrote for a little art magazines and stuff. And, um, and then, oh, I know, I, I, was, uh, I was about to start graduate school. And it was 1994. And the Republicans took over the Congress. Remember that? Yes, I do. And they called themselves the Ditto Head Caucus because they all thought that uh, Rush Limbaugh was responsible for their election, which was generally true. And I had never heard Rush Limbaugh. And I thought this that radio was having this huge effect on the country. And, and then, as now, people have their own listening habits. And you know, like I had never listened to these talk radio hosts um, and these shows, most of them still around, including Rush Limbaugh. And, and Alex I, Jones, was Alex Jones around then also? I don't remember him. Maybe, maybe. Um, so I decided I should dig into this. And um, I just ended up keeping it. It ended up being a diary of listening, which was actually, you know, horrible. The the book itself, or the listening to the both. But um, I mean, it's a very like young, angry person's book. But also, the listening to them made me a little young, angry, crazy. Person. I mean, it was it was really horrifying because I, you know, I was like a nice person. And they were saying some really, really murderous, literally murderous things, you know. I mean, it was also before Littleton. This was basically the year 1995. It was the year um, of like the Patriot movement became, um, right. was really outed culturally because of the Oklahoma City bombing. Um, the first day, I think I turned on the radio and there was a, um, a kid calling in a conservative talk show saying that um, he had a paper route and this other kid was horning in on his paper route and what should he do? And the host advised him to get a gun. Or I remember visiting my parents in Montana and there was a big snowstorm and, and um, it was at night and it was really beautiful and I dug out my old cross country skis and I went cross country skiing and through the streets and it was very beautiful and I came back and I turned on the radio and one of these hosts was saying that um, one way to employ all the welfare mothers was to line them up at the border and have them gun down all the illegal immigrants. And so if you listen to that kind of Wait, thing. Have, have women on welfare be responsible for murdering? Incoming Got it. Uh, illegal immigrants across the southern border. So like, if you listen to stuff like this every day for a year, it really gets to you. Or it didn't me. Um, so it was, uh, I mean, the one thing I think there is value in just the doc documenting all of that. It's right. kind of an historical document at this point, you know? Um, and so that was, yeah, that was my first book. And so after that somewhat poisonous experience. Mm -hmm. But it was like one great thing that came out of it was there was this one guy doing this weird local show in Chicago where I was right. living and that man was Ira Glass and he was starting This American Life and right after that I, I started working for him. And that was because he read 
part of the book? He read one of the He was in, in the, the book because I, I actually, one of the things in the book is right towards the end, they were starting This American Life, and I went and hung out with them for a day as they were making it. And then I just kind of became friends with him and was having dinner with him not long after that and telling him this one story. And, and he was like, oh, great, can I give you a microphone? So that's how that started. It so, was during the, I was in the embryonic stage when Ira was trying on his Rush Limbaugh personality. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, did ha he had this like crazy local show called The Wild Room, where he and this other kind of unhinged guy would, uh, I mean, it's an interesting, there's some interesting stuff in that book because uh, it's where I first heard of the internet, like, and, and it was when Wait, they were- when did it come out? It was it was documenting the year 1995, 1995 right. and uh, they were they I remember they did a show develop, devoted to this thing called America Online, and I was I just I was like what like these people are talking to each other but not on the phone you right. know I mean there's a lot of stuff where it's like it's happening when you fi first find out about something you know right. 1995, I thought the internet was more, I feel like 1995 I was, I, already... I mean, I was like kind of, I was never a forward thinking technologist. Right, right. Let's put it that way. Um, and so. But I knew, I mean, remember this thing with the rectangle? Uh -huh, like yeah. that's the kind of stuff I knew about. Right, right. <laughs> so from there, you um, and immediately started doing things for Iron for This American mm -hmm. Life. Yeah. And were you surprised, or how did you find that experience? I mean, for I, it seems that writing for print um, or for a written medium is so different from writing for radio. Yeah, I mean, for one thing, the great thing about radio is you don't have to have transitions. You just like say something, play some music, and then you can move on to the next thing. Right. So that's simpler. Although I always feel like that's what chapters are for, which you <laughs> skip in yeah, your I books. Yeah, don't, I don't have chapters, but I do have breaks, right. which is basically the music. Of, the, of, your, of your books. Yeah. Why, why uh, jumping around a little bit, but why, I've always been curious about that. Why? Because I feel like chapters are so useful in order to give yourself an out for a transition. Uh, and also to give readers like a sign that they can take a break, you know, sort of like recollect themselves. So why do you not have? I chapters? don't care whether the you reader don't... takes a break or right. not. Like, they do that. You know, they do that when you're not looking. Where, whatever. Like, they could be in the middle of one of your chapters, and they could take a and break the, anyway. The dryer button could like, and they're like, oh, I got to get that stuff out of the dryer. That they're taking that break, whether you're at the end of the chapter. Or I not. have trackers in my book, and yeah, I try to ensure that that's not happening. Yeah. Um, I think the chapters are why you have tenure. That you think that's. <laughs> yeah. Like, like uh, tenure. I think committees actually the care about that. Are why I have oh tenure, yeah, footnotes. Footnotes. Cha you have chapters, footnotes. You're like a real. You're like a real writer. Right. <laughs> Um, I don't. I don't like chapters for me personally because I find them um, kind of constraining. But also, like certain information, sometimes it uh, some like chapters tend to have a um, equal weight or something. And for me, certain things are only there's like a small thing and a big thing, and then a medium sized thing, and then another small. Th like you know, I just like to. Um, I like to do each discrete chunk, let it be what it is. Right, okay. And also, um, I, I mean, writing about American history, I feel like for the general reader is what I do. And I, I'm always trying to get away from that textbook mentality, you know? Is that something that you were worried about with radio on or with your, well that your that was a diary so it was just every day or whatever but um and was, then there were essay collections so those were just specific ex, ex, yeah mm -hmm, right. that was an essay collection but um so what was your first I also just don't want I don't want the reader to like really stop I just want it to all be one narrative or feel like it I don't know I just don't like chapters for me right 
Okay. It's I'm not going to force you choice. to do it's to a, do chapters. It's a personal choice. Um, uh, what was your first book that was not a collection or not a diary? What was your first sort of it history book as a history It was called Assassination book? Vacation. Right. It was about the assassinations of Presidents Lincoln, Garfield, and McKinley. Or as my um, editor put it, all the ones except the one people care about. Right. <laughs> I feel like people care about Lincoln. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Uh, the other two. Possibly not so Possibly much. not, yeah. Um, uh, and so that was, I mean, that's a, it's a fairly dramatic shift from writing sort of essay-sized chunks to mm -hmm. writing um, to writing essentially a book of history. Mm -hmm. uh, what what made you decide to make that to make that shift? I yeah, there was kind of when I first started working on that radio show, I would do stories about whatever, and most of them were kind of arts related, like about songs or movies, or they were personal or personal essays. And then there was this shift when I did, um, I made a documentary that was an hour long where my sister and I drove the Trail of Tears because our um, family is part Cherokee. And that like really changed my life because I had n never done anything like that. And I just loved the whole process. I loved the research, I loved going to the historic sites. And I also felt like um, it was interesting doing the research because it was not, even though I liked it, the reading, I never found any really pleasurable reading about the subject. About the Trail of Tears. Y yeah. <laughs> It's, it's a shocker. Yeah. No, but I, I mean, you can write about a bummer in a, in a, right, in right. a, in a pleasant or in a like entertaining way or, sure. or a gripping way or just a way that makes you want to read uh, for the heck of reading. And I, and I thought I was, and I also never found a really coherent yet complicated version of the story because it is a very complicated story and there's a lot of, um, within the tribe itself, some betrayals. It's not necessarily an entirely heroes and villains kind of story. And there are a lot of intricacies. And I never found a story, a version of it that was coherent, but still complicated, and that I like enjoyed reading. And I was really proud of how we put that story together and explained things without dumbing it down but still being coherent, you know? Right. Um, so I felt like I, and then I got all this mail from people where they would say, I didn't know about this. Thank you for telling me about it. Or I sat down at the kitchen table with my children and talked about Indian genocide. And, <laughs> and I felt like. Um, we all had a good laugh. Yeah. I felt like it had a purpose, you know, and that people had this kind of hunger to learn about their past in a way that maybe. Um, they didn't all get from school. So, so when you say that there, there, you didn't find anything about Trail of Tears that was enjoyable to read. Do you do you mean that wasn't like turgid and 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 dense and felt like work? I, <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, like you know, when like if you read Hannah Arendt talking about the Eichmann trial, that right. is a gripping book yeah, yeah. about a pretty grim subject. That's what I mean. I mean but there wasn't, it wasn't. I mean, I don't. Well crafted. I, yes, that's what I meant. Mm -hmm. um, and I so, mean, I find too, like one of the pitfalls of writing about history is when you do the research. There's so much, and you learn so much, and you go to so much trouble and expense to learn things that are to other people not interesting, not relevant, um, and sometimes with <clears throat> more proper historians, I feel like. Uh, they're not as judicious about leaving some of that stuff out. They're like, I had to go to Germany to learn this, and so right, you right. have to suffer too, you know? Right. Like when I was working on that, that assassination book, the last chapter is on the Lincoln Memorial because it was sort of the culmination of what Theodore Roosevelt, who became the president after McKinley was assassinated, it was kind of the culmination of that whole generation and what they thought Lincoln and the Civil War was about. So the last chapter was on the Lincoln Memorial. And 
you know, it took decades for that to get built. And in those decades, there were all these commissions because like Washington loves a commission and all of these arguments about where should it be? What should it look like? Who should design it? And I knew the answers. Like I, I knew about every single one of those commissions and read their, you know, and um, that chapter was when I first read it. It was so long and it was like all the commissions. Was Jeff your editor? Uh huh, yeah. But I mean, I, and one thing, here's another thing that I think is practical. Um, I always read everything aloud, and maybe it does come from like starting in radio, but uh, when you read something aloud and that you've written and you yourself are bored. And then that's generally a good sign right. that other people will be. And I remember it reminded me of when I was in school um, at, at my college, one of the film students, his final film, it was a film of highway signs, and it was just highway signs. And I remember he, he showed it, and the professor at the end was like, who is this film for? <laughs> other highway signs? You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, and... Uh, there's kind of that where like I had just devoted weeks and weeks to learning like all of the things the Lincoln Memorial could have been. And then I realized like, oh, I have to just cut this down to maybe, you know, a paragraph or something or um, there's, uh, there's maybe, there's a paragraph in that Lafayette book that I think the paragraph cost me $1,800. <laughs> And you would, like, that's a lot of money. Wait, what, where did you I don't, to okay. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. It was really stupid. On, it was some stupidity on my, fault, on my part and my friend. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the, the paragraph is, cost me $1,800. But you would think there was a part of me that wanted to maybe beef that up a little more, just to make it a little more right. cost effective. But it's like, <laughs> nothing happened, and it cost $1,800. Right. And I just have to suck it up. And, you know, it's, you know, a paragraph. Right. But I think sometimes other historians, they include everything because maybe that's their goal, to be exhaustive. I think some of them, that's the goal. But my goal is um, to be interesting. To be, to be something that people or want like to Or like relevant, or it has to be relevant or interesting or useful or... Um, just, or maybe sometimes fascinating, like one of the things that, one of the downsides of um, working in radio, and especially on This American Life where the, the, it has a very strict format and they have a kind of very traditional kind of cinematic structure where stories have to go somewhere and make a point and have an epiphany and a conclusion. And sometimes there's just some weird thing you learn, you know, that's cool. And I, we always called the, when I always called those my shenanigans, and I would just like put them into a story, and Ira Glass and I would always have these negotiations over, where- Over the number of shenanigans? Yeah, he would be like, uh, that's a shenanigan. I'm like, I know, isn't it interesting? And he would be like, you just had a shenanigan 40 seconds ago. You can't have two shenanigans. I'm like, okay. I need to, I'm gonna you need to- You can't have two really interesting things side by side, but. <laughs> But it, something has to, like, a story has to be propelled forward or, you know, it just has to, like, move, it, everything has to keep moving. And, and one of the things I like about writing books is things don't have to keep moving in that direction. You can, like, veer off, like a detour. And you, know? you can do that in books just be by, by dint of there's their length. More, there's more room. Um, also, I think uh, listener, readers are just more... That they're um, they have more patience than listeners, you know, because a listener is kind of like a dog. They like, just seem to sit there. Well, like a dog will be like, with themselves. you, and then it's like, what's that? And uh, right. like, you know, uh, or they're driving, or they're doing chores, or we have very different dogs. <laughs> <laughs> but like a reader, you have a reader's attention, and if you lose the reader's attention, she just goes back to where she lost her train of thought. So you can keep a reader. Um, you can go a lot more places, I think, with a reader. Like a listener, you're just trying to like keep them with you. You know. Right. You can't. You can't go off. Somewhere, yeah, shenanigans. No, mm -mm. I need to re. I, I've always used shenanigans as um, false. 
False. Like if I call shenanigans on someone, it means like I don't believe that. So oh. I need to rethink my use of shenanigans. Yeah, no, it's just like a fun, fun thing. Right. Like in that book, there's a whole section that's supposed to be about the Battle of Brandywine, but I really like the paintings of Andrew Wyeth. Okay. And uh, I'm, and the Battle of Brandywine happened in the the Brandywine Valley where Andrew Wyeth painted right. his paintings. And so sometimes I can I can um, make I can like weld those things together. But sometimes I'm just like literally playing hooky from researching the Battle of Brandywine to go look at paintings because they're interesting. And because the Battle of Brandywine is not as interesting. It's pretty interesting right. stuff. No, I, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, but I'm just saying, like, it's just something, like, it happened, and it's interesting, and I feel like it, there's enough there to, for it to, reason to be there. Uh, so you, you, you said that you like what you write to be relevant or useful or informative. Um, uh, and the subjects that you've chosen for your history books have been, um, I don't think that any of them are sort of obvious subjects if someone's thinking, what's the most relevant or useful or informative part of American history, like the Puritans or, um, or Lafayette. Uh, um, so, and yet these are things that you've obviously managed, or the overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy. Um, well, I mean, let's see. I mean, I was writing about the overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy and how America took over the Sandwich Islands right at a moment where we were um, invading these countries in the Middle East and engaging in regime change. You know, I'm, I'm sold. You don't okay. need to convince me. All right. I, 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 I'm, I don't, just... I'm not saying there's like, a, there's like an equal value of relevance, but there are overtones that I generally I like for things to somehow speak to the present moment. Like the Lafayette book, it started out as it came from a, you know, just writing about not his service in the Revolutionary War, but when he came back in the 1820s, and he um, was it 40,000 people greeted him. Is that right? In New York, New York Harbor, City? I think it was something like 80,000. 80, 80,000. Yeah. Right. So oh, it's like 4, a really people came to greet the Beatles. Right. And so it was this really big deal when he came back in the See, 1820s. I read your book. Thank you. Good job. Um, and he, like, it was a party every night for 13 months. He went to every state, and the whole country just fell back in love with him. And it was just, he was like this article of agreement. And I thought, oh, that'll be nice to work on a book that about this guy everyone liked, which there aren't that really many people in this country that, you know, everyone likes. And, and then I started um, researching it and basically at every point in the story, whether he's a young man in the war or when he comes back in the 1820s, all it is is Americans like bickering around him and like having these arguments and the Continental Congress is not getting along with the Continental Army. And, um, and when he comes back in the 1820s, it's during the election of 1824 where there wasn't a clear winner in the Electoral College and it was this big fight and the House of Representatives had to pick the president and um, it could have led to violence, but it didn't. But um, so the thing that seemed exotic about him, about writing about this person that all the Americans agreed on as a vacation from you know this country we live in where we you know, can't agree on anything. It just brought me back to. We can't agree on anything. Yeah, right. and and we and because our founders built this country to be that way. And so when you as an argumentative, you know, as like the point of this country is um, that everyone has the right to argue and say what they think, believe what they want. And uh, how, like, the way the country is founded, like, that's how we turned out. Right. I mean, there's something in, in, in all of your books. There's so I something, find that relevant. Uh, I, yeah, I was not, I'm not, uh, well, yes. Um, uh, um, there's something in all of your books that is um, kind of optimistic and hopeful. Oh, really? I think so, yeah. I mean, in the sense that there, you have a certain, um, 
in the way that you were just talking, that animated sense of an animating sense of America as being a noble and worthwhile experiment um, uh, sort of runs as a through line. Even when you're talking about times in American history when we as a country um, or our leaders have not always behaved well. Uh, um, is, it, is, it, is that something you come to naturally? Is that something that you felt like has, as you learned more about history, you sort of came around more to that point of view? I mean, I've always had a kind of split version of the history because of who I am and, and my family. And you know, the first American history I learned was the Trail of Tears. So the first American history I learned was about a constitutional failure and how the, um, you know, Jacksonian removal policies forced my ancestors at gunpoint to Oklahoma. And um, so that always shaded any gullible flag waving qualities I have. Um, like there's no getting around that. But I mean, one of the reasons, I mean, and that was because when I was a kid, there was, uh, it was like the 70s and there used to be a big fad. Some of them still exist for these outdoor amphitheater historical dramas. Like there's one um, down south about um, the Roanoke colony. I think the Mormons have one and the Cherokee Nation had one where it was this big pageant. And every summer we would go to the, um, Cherokee Nation capital in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, and watch this being um, this theater version of the Trail of Tears. And it was very theatrical with like dance. It was the only theater I basically saw till I think I was, you know, 13 or something. So that was the first history I knew. I knew that I hated Andrew Jackson before I ever heard of George Washington. So Literally that, before you had heard of George Washington? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, I, Andrew Jackson was the first president I ever heard of. It's kind of like I'm, if you ever are in a conversation with an Irish person and there's a lull, just bring up Oliver Cromwell. And they'll just, you know, they just can't shut up. It's like one of those kind of things where it's just your birthright it's to like Sarah, Sarah hate this guy. Party tips. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so there is that. I've always had this like there's like always going to be an asterisk on the big um, American ideals. Right. But also, I don't know, um, like I was, uh, I, I was also a kid during the bicentennial in, 17, in um, 1976. And there was the, the freedom. I mean, around here, you must all take this for granted. But there was this thing called the Freedom Train. And it had um, the Declaration and the Constitution like on a train. And it went around the country. And I remember going to that. And, uh, and um, you were really, it was like one of those big indoctrinating years and all the like old fashioned American civic stuff. And I did, you know, lap that stuff up. And I still do believe, you know, like that idea all men are created equal. I mean, I think, can you think of something more important that's been said? Like, I can't. Than all men are created equal? Yeah. Uh, Sure, there are some edits I might make to the statement. <laughs> well, but, sure. Um, but that idea, you know, is, right. is a pretty sound idea. Right. And, um, and I believe that. And so, um, I mean, that does animate how I write about the history. And also, and, and maybe more and more as I get older, I don't need everybody to be perfect. Right. I think... I mean, we were kind of talking about this earlier, how every, um, I don't know. We were, we, you didn't I, miss part of we, the conversation. Yeah, this was I, and this isn't really an idea that I've fully formed, but I kind of, it's sort of interesting to me how, um, especially online and, and in social media, not that I'm like terribly part of that world, but there, there's all this nitpicking at everybody. And um, people want, um, I guess, everyone to be these well-rounded, likable people all the time, you know? And I don't really need that. And um, like, for, we were specifically talking, I was reading the um, oral history of Monty Python. 
I, I was going to find a way to get to that. Yeah, and um, and on the tri on the um, plane here, and a l one of the undercurrents in the Monty Python story is that Graham Chapman was lazy, and didn't, you know. He didn't do a lot of the real elbow grease on putting the shows which, together. Which Python was Graham Chapman? Um, like he's Brian, he's Brian, Brian in right. Life of Brian, and um, he's the gay one. <laughs> um, but he did, like he would just sit there and the other Pythons would do the work and he would just kind of be around and he was also an alcoholic, so he was drunk a lot. But there's died this super one- pretty young, right? Died of, pretty young, yeah, yeah he was of the, cancer. He was tall. He wasn't the tallest, I don't think, was he? I thought he was. We can Anyone? like look that up later. But okay. anyway, what happened was uh, John Cleese had uh, purchased a faulty toaster. And he, he was really irked about it. And he wrote this whole long, beautifully crafted sketch about trying to return this, um, this toaster that didn't work. And um, Graham Chapman, who I guess always was smoking a pipe, he, he just you know, read it, he's like, yeah, it's boring. It needs to be a parrot. <laughs> and so that's all he contributed right. to the parrot sketch right. was the idea that it was a parrot. It, it's, it, it, is, it started out as basically a, a, a customer complaint of John But Cleases. my point is talking about like the country and the founders and everything. Sure, they had flaws, you know, and they weren't perfect people and maybe they didn't write like perfect phrases. But you know, they, there's still value there. Um, like, and I, I, I would hate to lose that. Like, I, I was writing um, an op-ed for the Times this summer about, you know, there was this guy running for president, and he was picking on these people whose kids, kid had died in Iraq. He's now the president, yes. but at the time, um, it's uh, so the the um, what happened was the father of the slain soldier had pulled the Constitution out of his pocket at the Democratic National Convention. Anyway, I was writing this thing about um, George Washington and the founding of the country and how in this letter, I'm sure you all know it, that George Washington wrote to the synagogue in Newport after Rhode Island was the last um, state to ratify the Constitution. And uh, one of the Jews of the synagogue wrote Washington this letter saying basically, hooray, you know, about um, the Bill of Rights. I'm paraphrasing. And uh, <laughs> Washington writes this beautiful letter about, back about um, how this government that, that um, he and his friends are building is not about mere toleration, like every, because He's implying like tolerance means, and he says like that means one people is putting up with another people because now we're all equal and we can all believe um, we can all believe what we want and sit under our own vine and fig tree, and um, specifically that piece was about the presidency and how the first president who invented the presidency was saying like he was literally making case for what the First Amendment was about, and it was about everyone is allowed to believe what they want. And um, I spent a whole day arguing with the um, editor who was passing on the failings of the editorial board that I had not mentioned that Washington owned slaves. Right. I was like, first of all, I feel like if you're reading the New York Times opinion page, you probably know that. And second of all, it's like off the top, like, like he had a whole life. Yes, he did own slave, but he did some other stuff, you know. Right. And I, I had to like spend a whole day trying to figure out like how to like bend to their will without bending to their will. But it really so bugged how me. So how did you handle that? Um, I think what happened was I, I mentioned the thing about where he says everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree. And I said, pause here a century or two oh, yeah, wh right. while everyone become, includes actually everyone, or something like that. Right. So I sort of alluded to it without saying, and he owns slaves. Right. But my point is um, he did own slaves, but he did some other worthwhile things. Um, and I don't remember how we got off on that. Just like, um, oh, talking about the founding. like. Um, 
And how, I mean, how? There is real value in these people and what they did, even if they were imperfect and they, you know, owned people. Right. I mean, we shouldn't forget either thing. We shouldn't forget they owned people. But um, it's like when I was writing about the Boston Puritans, which I found even people in Boston hate them. But uh, <laughs> one reason I wanted to write and about them. And they hated them, each other. I mean, they liked, some of them liked each other. Some of them liked some of each other. Yeah. Right. But uh, one of the things I, why I wanted to rescue them was because I found the word Puritan was kind of used as shorthand for idiot. Partly because the um, Salem witch trials and all that, which came later, and those were stupid. But I, I was like, yeah, they said and did um, unreasonable things, but they lived before the age of reason. And they still were, you know, some of the most learned, bookish people of their time. And, you know, when they came here, um, they were only here for, you know, basically five minutes and they started um, building that other college down the street because they didn't want their ministers, they wanted their ministers to know Greek and Hebrew and um, they needed their, uh, their clergymen to be learned and you know a lot of them had theology degrees from Cambridge and they were thinkers and readers who are mainly focused on one book, but they they had ideas and they you know and and um, they weren't just idiots. Right, right. I mean, it is it's an interesting challenge today, and it's certainly something that has come up a lot in the past several years, which is how do you um, uh, fully take stock of historical figures while respecting both the realities of their time and our time. Yeah, I mean, it is always like, that is always a pickle, but I mean, I find one of the things that's just really useful in life in general is empathy. And, um, and it can also just be really educational. Um, I mean, sometimes writing nonfiction, sometimes the most basic, the most basic instinct is to just find the truth. And sometimes that um, there's a lot to be learned in just trying to like get to the facts. Like when I was writing about um, the American takeover of Hawaii, there's still a lot of acrimony in the Hawaiian Islands today, and there's a whole sovereignty movement in which Native Hawaiians are still um, protesting the you know overthrow of their queen in 1893 and the annexation of the islands by the United States in 1898. People are still upset about that, and I understand. Why? Um, but, and so the, um, the people who engineered that were the uh, children and grandchildren of uh, New England missionaries, like, you know, specifically these missionaries who came from Boston Harbor and sailed all the way to the Sandwich Islands to, you know, they, not just the Sandwich Islands, all over the world, these New England missionaries would show up in a place and tell people how wrong they were. And, um, and then, so those people were actually idealistic in their way, but their children and grandchildren are the ones who started the sugar plantations. And they ended up, by the end of the 19th century, white people owned like 90% of the land there. And, in and, Hawaii. Yeah, and they're the ones who overthrew the Hawaiian queen and, and gave the islands to the United States. And so amongst, especially the native population there, there's still a lot of anger toward the, the missionary boys, as they're known. And I understand that. But at some point in the research, I found the actual letter from Boston, all roads lead back here generally, um, where the mission uh, HQ here in Boston sends them this, this letter, I think, you know, 40 years into the mission. And some of these people, they've been, they were born in Hawaii, they've never been anywhere else. And they get this letter saying, we're cutting you off, good luck. We're like, and they're just stopped, they're not gonna fund the mission anymore. And these people have never lived anywhere else. And they, you know, it's their home and they have kids and, uh, and they live in these islands with a 365 day growing season. So they start being farmers and they start growing sugar and that takes off and that the sugar plantations just completely change everything. They change the, 
politics, they changed the ecology, like, you know, um, growing sugar takes a lot of water, and um, they changed the racial makeup of the islands because they bring in all these workers from all over the world, from Japan, the Philippines, uh, Scandinavia, Portugal, and everything changes because of these sugar plantations, and every change affects the natives negatively. Um, but <laughs> but it, it just goes back to that letter saying, um, you're on your own, and these people are stuck, and they got to make a living, and that's how the plantations start. And it's just, it's not this nefarious plan to take the over the government right. and take over all the land. It's, it's basically like each family deciding, oh my god, we got to eat, what are we going to do? And I think that's something anyone can identify with, you right. know? And so sometimes all of these like big historical debates and problems and everything can always like harken back to some small human moment. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, there are a couple more things um, I want to ask you about, but why don't we open this up for a little while um, to questions. We have two microphones. Um, uh, if you are comfortable, please state your name um, so we know who you are uh, when you ask a question. Where and are the microphones? There's one there and one there. Oh. Sort of halfway up the, mm -hmm. the stairs. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, if people have questions, head over to the mics and ask. And while you guys are screwing up your courage to do that, um, uh, is there something you're working on now, a new project that you have in mind? I know earlier today you went out to Walden. I think there's some, I mean, I don't think it's my next book or anything, but I have been thinking about Thoreau a lot. And I, yeah, I did go to the pond and... Um, it wasn't a Don Henley pilgrimage. It was a Thoreau thing. Um, he's one of those people where I, he's one of those people I, I always want to stick up for because they're every so often there's some like, pers like uh, it was, uh, maybe it was just in the New Yorker like last year where yeah, someone yeah. was just like, I hate Thoreau and you should too. And I get that he's a dented person and maybe not always a barrel of laughs, but there are a lot of things worth admiring about him and what he did and that place and living there. And uh, I, I mean, I, I'm drawn to writing about people, like um, one of my, my favorite Puritan was um, the guy who founded Rhode Island because the Boston, you know, booted him out of Massachusetts Bay was Roger Williams. And I think I describe him as someone who's hard to like, but easy to love, you know? I think of like Thoreau in that collection of hard to like. He's not yeah. so bad, you right. know. Right, he did right. A couple I mean, of really transcendent things. He has some good sentences, and also he was a conductor on the Underground Railroad. Right. I feel like that's a pretty good life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So lay off, right? <laughs> New Yorker magazine. Catherine Schultz. <laughs> um, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Pete Riley, and uh, hi. Hi. The. The question I have, I'm listening to you, I was just thinking that, do you think you could write about Andrew Jackson? I mean, I have a little bit. When I was writing about uh, the Trail of Tears and his part in it, and one of the things that happened on that documentary was I went to the Hermitage, his house in Nashville, and um, as my sister would, would tell you, I probably could have been a little better behaved when I was there. <laughs> um, so I don't know if I have more to say about him. I mean, he is interesting to me, too, because even though like I'm part Cherokee, but mainly I'm all riffraff. And so for, my, my riff, for the riffraff side of me, you know, like he's it. He's the guy that makes it possible for people like us, um, the nobodies, uh, to um, think they be can become president. Um, and, you know, there are things about him that I do like and admire and, you know, how he handled the nullification crisis and all that. And so I kind of think of myself as a Jacksonian Democrat who hates Andrew Jackson. Um, but I don't know if I have more there, more to say. I don't know. Thanks. So I have gotten a little bit of revenge on him. <laughs> and I'm really looking forward to... Um, him sharing his money with Harriet Tubman. <laughs> yes. Yes, uh, Ken Oy from Hi. MIT. Uh, Did you say from MIT? Here. Here. <laughs> okay. Um, I loved 
Trail of Tears, and I loved your early work on radio. And mm -hmm. I particularly loved your remark about how people are complex. There are many assets and faces to them. You mentioned Washington. We had a little challenge posed to you on Jackson. In my family history, I think about Franklin Roosevelt, mm. who did great things, but also locked my parents up in prison camp. Yeah. The obvious are question. You, are you a Japanese American? Yes, I am. Yeah. But the obvious question is that we have a current incumbent of the office of the president. Uh huh. And I can see problematic aspects of his character and what he's been doing. Mm-hmm. That was nicely put. In, <laughs> in 10 or 20 years, when you're writing a book looking back, when you become the historian looking upon the current period, what do you expect to be able to say that would offset some of the deficits that stare us squarely in the eye? Wow. Um, no pressure. <laughs> I mean, one thing I do, no matter what I'm writing about, is uh, I mean, there's that um, saying that history was written by the winners, but it's not true. It's written by the writers. And um, one thing I always love when I'm delving into some something, and especially writing about American history, there are a lot of just mistakes and bad decisions, and you know that was obviously a big one of the big ones. There's always someone who's speaking out, you know, like writing about the, um, I mean, one of them, the bees in my bonnet is always the Spanish-American War. And um, there's, and when I, I remember when I was, um, I was writing some op-eds for the Times right after we invaded Iraq. And I would write my little, um, this is a bad idea, kind of op-eds, and I think like, this isn't doing anything, I should just be faxing them into the trash can <laughs> under my desk, you know? But the, they're part of the record, just like Henry, J uh, not Henry James, what's his brother's name? William, William James. James. Uh, William James or Mark Twain or people, you know, arguing like, we should not be torturing the Filipinos. There's like this record, there's always a record of people who are standing up. There's always an argument, there's always a conversation. And I think it's valuable to go back and read those um, as like what I could say about now, yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's pretty depressing. <laughs> I mean, I, has anyone been watching the Ken Burns Vietnam War series? Exactly. I don't, are you finding it, this is a terrible thing to say, but slightly comforting how f stupid the leadership was throughout the war and how, um, so much of it is the bad decisions and you know life and death decisions are being made because uh, people don't want to be embarrassed. It's all about like most of history is um, the delicacy of the male ego, I find, and so or like um, you know there's that um, Johnson he, like there, he's on tape talking about how like candidate Nixon is committing treason by going behind his back and, you know, um, back channeling with the Vietnamese. And there's all this really evil, evil stuff going down. And um, it makes me feel less alone. <laughs> so, I mean, to, I guess the thing is always just tell the truth. I mean, I've been thinking about it lately because uh, I noticed, one thing I noticed watching um, Al Gore plug his a movie recently, or ta Coates has his new book out, and the interviewers, when they're interviewing them about, you know, the racial situation in America or uh, climate change, um, they always, and like the TV journalists, like, can you give me some hope? And um, Gore does, ta Coates is like, nope. But uh, it's like, why, why do we need, like, everybody to be hopeful? You know, sometimes you just want the person to say, like, Here's the problem. Like, there's value in that, you know? So, um, I don't see that I'm, like, God, wouldn't that be the worst? I mean, the one thing that happens is, looking back, is things all seem to always get worse in some ways in terms of public discourse. Like, um, I was working with these high school students this past year, and they were having a hard time dealing with, you know, current events. And I remembered being their age, and um, I don't know if you remember this, when President Reagan was trying to back, like it was during the Iran-Contra um, thing, and uh, President Reagan goes on TV and he says, so I told you, 
<laughs> that we did not um, trade arms for hostages. I believe and that in I, my heart. Right? Yeah, I believe that in my heart. It turns out not to be true, but I believe that it is true. What he said something like, I believe it in my heart, but the facts say differently. Yes. Or something like Wait, that. hand me that. I think I like, I don't have, I don't have glasses, so you Here, don't have I, to I'll read find it. it. You find it. So, like, but I remember being appalled as a kid, like, the president is coming on TV and saying he believes something in his heart. Like, if I pulled that shit in a high school term paper, I would be like, that would, I would get a D, right? And so I just remember being like outraged. Like, the president is coming on TV and saying he believes something in his heart. But he did, like, say the truth. He did say, like, it doesn't feel true, but it's actually the truth. He said, it was a few months ago I told the American people I did not trade arms for hostages. My heart and my best intentions still tell me that's true, but the facts and evidence tell me it's not. Yeah. So, I mean, at the time, I was just outraged. Like, what is this bullshit? This, like, this is the you, president talking like this, like a nutcase. You said, you said that it, saying a falsehood that felt true in his heart seemed less intellectually rigorous than the average Wham song. Yes. But now, like, look, looking. R.I.P. George Michael. But, uh, yeah. But now it's like, well, at least he, like, faced the fact, even though he, you know, preceded it with a bunch of like fairy tale talk but now I mean that's sounding pretty good right <laughs> well it, it's I mean it, it, it's an interesting question um, because I think that a lot of people feel right now that uh, um, things are bad in a unique way and trying to frame that historically certainly reading contemporaneous accounts of Nixon you know I think Hunter Thompson's view of Nixon could not have been any lower. Uh, but it still seems like looking back, Nixon was several large steps ahead of Oh, Trump. what we wouldn't give for Nixon. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying, like, that's, that's what, not only am I not giving you hope, I'm saying, like, what if 20 years from now we look back at this nostalgically? <laughs> I'm waiting for you. It's like I'm the, the anti-John Lewis, right? <laughs> yeah. He said that, like, you know, the march of history is towards progress. Yeah. You're That's, saying the march of history is towards being fucked. Basically. I don't know. I mean, like, I do remember even with George W. Bush during. Have his, a good night, guys. Even, <laughs> even with his, um, when he was inaugurated, I was there, theoretically to protest, but all I did was just stand there and cry, you know? Wait, in 2000? Yeah, in 2000. I was, I was there. actually there at the inauguration. You were there? I was covering it. Oh, okay. I was just standing there crying. And, um, <laughs> but, but later in his presidency, when he actually ha did stuff like, you know, invade Iraq and remember that whole Katrina thing. And, and I was like, what was I crying about? I thought he would be bad for drinking water Right, like right. or something. Like well, I again, had now, like I what had, we would give it was for like George a, W. Bush. It was like a failure of my imagination that I was crying for. Like, oh, I hope he doesn't ruin the drinking water and the economy, right. and like all these people are going to die. But <laughs> like, Sarah and Seth, we now look back upon W. Mm -hmm. with a certain degree of nostalgia and appreciation yeah, for his commitment to human rights. Right. While he tortured. Sure, there was that. There's that asterisk. He was good on AIDS. AIDS in Africa. Sort of, but. Uh, and also on. That's um, what. That's what I'm persecuting saying. Persecuting Arabs and Muslims after 9/11. It mm -hmm. was not perfect. Right. But the contrast with the current administration right. is striking. Yeah. So that's and, what I'm saying. Like, what? What if? Um, 20 years from now, we'll look back on this and be finding things to like about that it. That is frightening. The Thank thought you. of you visiting <laughs> Trump Tower. But that's my point. I mean. Yeah. Not yeah, everything has to be reassuring. Um, <laughs> yes, you have made that clear. Thank you. Uh, yes. Hi, my name is Renata. Um, I actually had a similar question because I thought I found your writings very reassuring during the Bush years, actually. Oh, thanks. And now, now I'm very depressed again, actually. Mm. Um, so I would just like to pivot, I guess, away from talking about our current president. And I'm just genuinely curious if you've read any of Bill O'Reilly's books about various assassinations, and if you have any thoughts. Killing about... fill in the blank? Yes. I have not read any of them. That's have probably you? good. Have you? I... <laughs> she has. Yeah. I, um, 
I have, yes. Uh, I actually have a podcast where we read like bad books and talk about them. Oh. So we read Killing Lincoln for that. Mm-hmm. It, it wasn't the worst book that we've read because yeah. we've read other Fox News right. books that were worse, but it's not great. Have you ever picked a book that you think this is going to be terrible and you're pleasantly surprised? Yeah. Oh. Um, like we thought Nora Roberts would be like really trashy and bad, but she's really great, really fun. Much less depressing than Bill O'Reilly. That is sure. um, that is a particular pleasure to f- like. I remember you know how um, um, you hear the name Charlie Chan, and it's and I think mainly from the movies, it's this um, mm, nefarious. He's this nefarious right. character, uh, but if you actually read all the books, what he is is he's a, a Chinese uh, of Chinese descent. A detective in the Honolulu Police Department, right. and all he does is, you know, pretend to be uh, this stereotypical uh, sneaky Asian. Yeah, mm-hmm. but but he is a, like a really smart sneaky right. Asian who's solving the crime and using all the white people's stereotypical ideas against them to get to the truth. And, um, and and it was like pleasant to find like, oh, Charlie Chan is always the smartest guy there. He's just pretending to be a dummy because that's how he can get his information. Anywho. All right. Well, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Hi. So I'm James Wilson, MIT CMS. I'd love to move from bubbled water towards that sort of straight water you referenced earlier on. Wait, I'm sorry. Say that. Can you say that again? I'd love to move from the bubbled water towards that sort of straight water, as mm-hmm. you described earlier on. Mm-hmm. So right now, I'm it's a been too bit... bubbly for us talking about like how sh- shitty things are. Mm-hmm. Actually, no. Oh. So, so the good news is the shittiness isn't the bubbles. In my case, I'm hoping to move towards clarity. So maybe my metaphor is poorly applied. Core tension is earlier on when you mentioned the, the sort of pushing against nitpicking and highlighted Washington owning slaves as an example and the sort of adjacent jazz with all men created equal, not just being rhetorically maybe a little outdated, but in the context of creation, not lived. You sort of seem to be marking these as background elements that we should sort of read the intent as more applicable today. Wait, say that, say that last. We can barely hear you. I don't know what you're doing over there. Is this better? Yes. Mm-hmm, it is. It looks really uncomfortable, but go on. We'll, we'll sort of work through it. Team effort. So when we were exploring the conversation about Washington and all men created equal, mm-hmm. those sort of contrary details, him owning slaves, many of the sort of folks writing the all men created equal narrative also owning slaves, that mm-hmm. seems like not nitpicking to call that out as maybe centrally problematic. As in, how, how do you interpret the messages when the lives seem to be so antagonistic to the message apparently woven? I mean, I think one thing about um, that affects me is having studied art history, you, I think this, yeah, remember that? The student of art history, like all you're presented with you're studying humanity's great achievements, and they're like the, mo- the most beautiful things and places in the world. And they're almost always made by drunks, philanderers, drug addicts. Like, I mean, the most you can hope for is a guy who just cheats on his wife and does painting on the side, you know? <laughs> like, all of the great, like, not all of them, I'm sure some of them were okay people, but mostly, uh, the great artists are always uh, troubling or nefarious or like not good people necessarily, you know. And but they still make beautiful things. And so I think you just kind of get used to putting up with the other stuff. Like, I mean, or in music. Like, um, I remember when I was a kid, I I played jazz, and I also had this cousin who was a drug addict. And one of the things I would do in high school, I was like a real, I had a real truancy problem, but I would always go like skip class and go to the public library. And there was this one point where I was really into um, John Coltrane. 
And uh, I remember skipping class and going to the library and reading about John Coltrane, who was, you know, a junkie. And like sitting there and thinking about, you know, John Coltrane, who I just looked up to like crazy. And then my cousin Marty, who was the bane of the family existence because of what he put his parents through and he was just this really talented person and he could never like get stay clean and it was just this thing I mean it's still going on honestly and uh, but I, and I was like super judgmental of Marty but I and I remember having this kind of epiphany that you know you could have this big problem and whether you see it as a disease or a character flaw it has you know I saw the beauty in John Coltrane and that made me like start trying to think of Marty in more human terms and like not not just writing Marty off as a person. Well, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> but um I, I totally wrote Marty off as yeah, a person. Yeah, totally. But um like with the these founders and they have these flaws are like owning people is like I it's up there with the flaws. But um, I don't think, like, I mean, one of the things about being Cherokee specifically, I think that gives me maybe uh, this perspective on humanity is that the Cherokee owned slaves, and they brought their slaves with them on the Trail of Tears. So it's hard to completely uh, identify with everything about them and, and uh, you know, give them a break on everything because, I mean, if you think it's bad to be this dispossessed Indian walking across country at gunpoint, it's worse to be one of their slaves. And there is, especially, I think, among a lot of, um, like, white people to just see the American Indians and always take their side and always, you know, think they're, like, the good people. But the good people were also the bad people. And um, I don't know, like, I, you can't, you just can't get rid of all this stuff. I can't make Jackson Pollock, you know, be a better person. Um, I can't make Jefferson not own his slaves. But that doesn't mean I can't still, like, learn from certain things or admire um, certain things about these people, you know? I think it, I, it, it who I, are people. I, don't, I'm, I certainly don't want to put words in your mouth. Um, but it, it's sort of how, when I read your work, I think that um, it's very hard to paint someone as a hero or a villain or good or bad. Um, it's almost always the complexity of the person. So in the same way that you acknowledge what Washington did, you also never sort of hold him up as like George Washington deity. Right. Of, um, but I also don't completely write him off. Or right. even Lafayette, who well, his teenage wife was pregnant when he like leaves to go to America. He was also 17. He was 17, I mean, but she was probably like 16 and pregnant, and right. he still leaves her to go toward like glory in America. I mean, and I don't run away from that. It's still a kind of icky thing to do. It's not as bad as owning people. No. He's I'm glad good, we, can, we can all agree on that. But I mean, that's what I'm talking about, like with the maybe with the the empathy and uh, like there are those uh, nonfiction writers, and usually their books are like the ones that are on the bestseller list for like weeks and weeks and weeks. They are so in love with their subjects, right. and I do envy that. They're like, oh my God, William Howard Taft! Like, <laughs> let me give him a hug. And I mean, that's not, those are not the people, I, I can't, I don't know if I just can't be like that. Um, like, I feel like I'm, I'm capable of unconditional love, but you know, not blind love, but I don't, I don't ever see myself like writing some book because like, oh my God, I love this guy. Right, right. It's like, he has some good qualities. Right. That's more my take, generally. Right. Or even the bad people, you know. Um, all right, let's do these two. If you can go up to one of them. It's just a kind of, it's an aside. I guess for me, like, you know, being, so where I'm coming from is, I, I think it's really uncomfortable, like, just the way, like, humor is used to kind of be specific of the past or the history. And I understand like kind of the need to to like nuance and 
make um, fully complex the history of these people, but at the same time, it's like very dismissive when we're like, oh, well, we did all these bad things, and it's kind of like we privilege the things that they did better than the things that they did wrong. And then we're also not talking about just like the history of like when you're talking about art history and the different people who who you're studying, it's like, well, there's a, there's many reasons why um, these white men are are going to be able to have more are going to be privileged in in the knowledge and kind of the culture production process. So I guess for me, I just feel like especially when like when you make kind of like these quick asides. I feel I feel really uncomfortable when it's like kind of like nervous laughter coming from the audience when they're like responding to like kind of making comments about slavery or you know it's, it's I just think that just like being conscious of like are we re um, reinscribing kind of the past and just continuing the same history of like okay we're we're making people feel uncomfortable but we're just gonna laugh about it you know because like. I don't know. I know I just... what you mean, and I think there is a difference um, between like an event like this, where you know we have whatever an hour and a half, or and versus a book like their whole swaths the, of the book, where it's way more meditative. And there's like a section in there where I'm talking about there's a moment when um, the British are ready to capitulate and they're ready to think the war is going so badly for them that they're ready to give the patriots everything they wanted before before they before the separation and there's a moment where i ponder like what well, not would everyone's going to read your book right so like you're sitting here in an audience and you have to just like kind of be mindful of the fact that when like it's kind of like at different touch points, like you're you're reaching different audience, and I understand like the, you're doing your thing, and it's not mm -hmm. necessarily a matter of like oh like I'm cr criticizing, but just um, criticizing you, but just like t keep in mind that there are going to be people who this is going to be their first time like interacting with history in this way, and so like when if it, we're in a public space and we're talking about like history and like and uh, using humor to like kind of like. Um, like, I don't know, it's just, it just makes me feel really uncomfortable because it's like, everyone's gonna leave this space, right? And then it's just, we, we don't know how people are gonna go and say, oh, it's okay that we're, like, we're sugarcoating the, cap, the past, but I think it's really important to be like, okay, we can nuance the past, but we also need to just be very critical. And like, and I just, I feel really, like, I don't know, I just like, I feel really uncomfortable. Like, being someone who's a descendant of enslaved people, and it's just kind of like, wow, like, we can, we, I don't know. There's just a lot. There's just a lot. <laughs> well, um, it sounds like you have some things to say about this, so uh, do, do more of that. But what, I, what I'm saying is, uh, I mean, do you believe that everyone is created equal and ha should have equal protection under the law? Yeah, but the intention versus, like, what's the reality? The reality of the situation mm -hmm. is that it's just, like, wait, no, 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 but like, can I just like comment? Like, sure. literally, some people just literally left because they're like, I feel uncomfortable. I feel like we're we're doing the same thing over and over again. And I'm like sitting here, like, okay, like, you know, like predominantly white audience. And like, when when you make comments about like slavery, it's just kind of like. <laughs> um, that's not. I'm sorry, I'm sorry about that. That's definitely not my intention. I mean, one of the things that I'm trying, I, I'm trying to like fit in a bunch of stuff. No, I know, but you're talking to an audience. It's just kind of like. <laughs> it's like, a, like humor's used a lot to just kind of be dismissive. And it's just like when you're sitting here and you're just kind of like. <laughs> Oh, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. One of the things, I'm not being, I don't use humor to be dismissive. One of the things I think we use humor for is um, because life is painful and it's one of the ways to deal with that. But it's also sometimes it's just um, a shorthand to get to the truth. It's, it's certainly like how I think. Like, let me try to think of an example. Um, like when we were talking about the inauguration of um, President Bush in 2000, and one of the reasons that I went there supposedly to protest was um, 
I was really upset with the process of that election, right? Because the Supreme Court ended up choosing the president and it was, it seemed to me a pretty fishy process. And I had like a lot of anger about that. It seemed arbitrary and unfair. And, um, but I'm a writer so I can't just, there has to be some like artistry into the communication of my anger. And everyone, when I was writing about that experience, like everyone at the time, that's all we talked about and thought about was that. And when I was writing about going to that inauguration, because it was gonna be for a book, I still, sometimes I know like people read things years and years and years later, and I needed to somehow communicate that it had been this big, like country-wide trauma of that election. And here's how I did it. Maybe, maybe you don't approve, but I was trying to refer to that when I was writing about that inauguration of um, the moment when um, President Bush finished his speech. And um, everyone was like walking out and I was standing out on the mall and looking up at the jumbotron and I was watching them all like file out and there was, you know, old President Bush and there was President Clinton and there was Al Gore and then I saw Bob Dole and, um, and I, I was, I thought, who I had always like grown up loathing as a person. And of course, now I would give anything to have him uh, running the Senate. But um, I saw him walk out of the dais and, and I said, like, I have developed a soft spot for Dole because he symbolizes a simpler, more innocent time in America when you could lose the presidential election and like not actually become the president. So instead of like spending five pages recapping everything that had happened, that was just like one quick way of saying, of communicating everything I felt about that election. And um, it's a joke and it's like quicker. And I would hope like a more entertaining way to say, oh, it was just like weeks and weeks and no one feels good about this outcome. So that's definitely how I write and think. Um, and I think also one of the things when I was set, talking about my argument with the Times about like not mentioning Washington being a slave owner, that wasn't about diminishing his slave owning, that was about respecting the reader. That was about me thinking like the readers know who this guy is and I just wanna talk about this one letter that he wrote and I don't need to do his whole biography every time I mention his name. And that was just about not dumbing it down for the readers. It wasn't about giving George Washington on a, a pass on the worst thing he ever did. It was about respecting the reader and their intelligence. But like, do the readers, like, I guess this is the thing is like, the way we're taught history is like, the readers don't actually know. Because like, a lot of readers don't, like. You don't like, think the people reading the opinion page of the New York Times that know that George Washington, how, how many people have just learned tonight that George Washington owned slaves? You just learned? Where are you from? England. He owned slaves. You should like, look into it. it was, it's a terrible pox on our country. Right. I know because you mainly talk about all of your conquests around the world. But um, that's all I'm saying. That wasn't about like giving Washington a pass. That was about, about like not dumbing it down for the reader. That's all. I understand, but I'm just saying like, it's assuming the readers are at one place and a lot of times the readers aren't. Like it's, it's kind of like, I just, I don't know, I think it's just so important like context. Like even, even though you're saying like, oh, I'm assuming that my readers are smart, but a lot of your readers aren't smart, right? Like a lot of your readers, like, or people- On the New York Times opinion page? No, no, they're no, pretty smart. Um, like think about like white liberals, right? A lot of white liberals, they're considered smart, but there are a lot of things that they don't know their own biases or they don't know their oh, own totally. biases. And so it's just kind of like, that's just where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. So right. it's, yeah, but yeah, we can move on, I guess. Yeah, I mean- No, I, it's worth talking about. I mean, I yeah. Think it, Another thing though, like I find, um, 
part of like our generation is um, we started school one way and then um, like multiculturalism happened. And there was a lot of um, uh, a lot of voices hadn't been heard, a lot of stories hadn't been told, and and it was like great getting to hear from those people and getting other sides of the story from like women, from like non-white men, from gay people, whatever. That was all good. But then there was also this um, like. The, there was this whole period where it was like the dead white men, and just because someone was a white guy, every, like they were no longer valuable. And you know, they do get on our nerves. But um, like, I thought it was really great recently. Like, my favorite book is Moby Dick. I just love Moby Dick. Um, and I, a I, lot of shenanigans. there are so many shenanigans in Moby Dick, and. Um, it's just this, like, so close to my heart, that book. It's so strange. It's just the language of it and the descriptions and the ideas. And um, I was, like, looking, I was trying to find out. I was trying to, I wanted to, I want to write up something about how all these interviewers make certain, um, make certain writers and thinkers give them hope. And I happened to, I was looking at um, Ta-Nehisi Coates' Twitter feed, trying to like see, does he ever address like, why do, why, why do I have to be the hope guy? Um, and there was just this whole part where he was talking about how much he loves Moby Dick. And I don't know where I'm going with this. Um, just some of it comes from um, coming out of that and coming, being in academia at that time where a lot of like babies got thrown out with the back bath water. And so I think what I meant to say and never got around to is because I believe in equality and I believe in religious freedom, um, some of the things that d disappoint us about our founders, like, is because I believed some of the things they said. It's because I believe in what George Washington was telling the Newport Jews about how like tolerance is a sham, we're all equal. I believe that. Or I do, I believe like all men are created equal. I believe that's the most important phrase because I think it's the most important idea. And the whole history of this country, which I have devoted my life to writing about, is about like some of us trying to, there's always, there are always people who are trying to make those things come true. And even if like the people who said those words or made those laws didn't completely believe in them, that stuff is there and it's always there for the people who want to claim that heritage and who always are trying to make those things come true. And I still think there's like, there's inherent value in the Declaration of Independence, there's inherent value in the letter to the Newport Synagogue. And the fact that these thoughts and beliefs are communicated and made into laws by these incredibly imperfect people, um, there's still value. It's like what I was talking about with Thoreau, I mean, or when I was writing about the Boston Puritans. I mean, my favorite sermon was the one that your, that Boston's um, founder, John Winthrop, gives either like back in England or on the boat, the one of the model of Christian charity, where um, it's this, it's where we get the image of New England as a city on a hill, but it, there's the part I love is where he's talking to his future neighbors and he says, um, we must be as members of the same body and love together, mourn together, suffer together as members of the same body. Partly because he is a Christian and he believes, he believes in that as an ideal, but also practically because they're coming in 1630, they're coming 10 years after the Plymouth Pilgrims and half the Plymouth Pilgrims died, and he's telling them we have to be together and be as members of the same body to survive. We have to take care of each other if we're going to actually live. 
in this hellish place that we've decided to like move to. All right, settle down. Uh, <laughs> but um, but and and that image is my ideal that this, this idea of the body politic and that we're all supposed to be as members of the same body suffering and mourning and rejoicing together. Even though when you know when they got here and Winthrop became the governor and he was leading the government, um, anyone within the circle, within that Puritan circle, they were all, you know, rejoicing and mourning together. And anyone who did not agree to agree with them got banished. Some of them, like Winthrop ordered, they would have their ears cut off. Um, that's why Rhode Island came into being. All these people who keep getting kicked out of Massachusetts, some of them with their ears sliced off. And like across the river, these people, um, you know, Winthrop's government, they were hanging the Quakers on Boston Common. Um, and so I still find a kind of um, spiritual loveliness about that sermon, even though the person who wrote that sermon did some really terrible things in the name of protecting that community that he's talking up. Um, so I think with, with, especially with American history, um, it's different, I think, than a lot of other countries because they don't have this mantle of, of all of these ideals to live up to, and we do. And often the people who are the most idealistic and the best at expressing those ideals are often the ones who like come up short in um, living up to them. And it's just something that's like, over and over again true in this country, and we have to come to terms with it. But I also think even if these people have done and said terrible, evil things, they've also done and said wonderful, idealistic, beautiful things that have actually made a lot of us want to become better people and better citizens, and so I won't completely disregard them or their efforts and their better angels, as Lincoln would say. Um, I think this is a, a, a conversation that we could continue to have and should continue to have. It's a larger conversation. The constraints of the time and when we have this room mean we can't actually continue it now. Um, but. Uh, I hope that we do continue the conversation. You can find me um, or email me. It is an important conversation and it's one that um, uh, we should have as a community, we should have as writers, we should have as people who um, think about and interpret both the past and current events, so. And I have one more thing to say about that, which is like this being um, a college, and one of the things, I mean, I was a an very- institute. An institute, sorry. Um, one of the things, uh, I mean, I was a very um, fiery young person, and I do go to a lot of colleges, and I have, one of the reasons like I bring stuff like this up is, um, I remember like early on I had written this piece about my father who was a gunsmith and like I write about trying to come to terms with this because I always just hated guns and and um, and I remember speaking at this one college and the um, students came away really hating that story because part of it was about like how I hate this thing my father is obsessed with, but I still love my father. And I remember being incredibly surprised hearing, um, I remember like a freshman class read this piece and they like couldn't understand like how I could love my father if I disapproved of the way he made a living. And that has always stuck with me as, um, maybe one of the purposes of, of speaking at institutes and what have you is just talking about like like that is one of the like fundamentals of life is trying to um, come to terms with the people you disagree with or disapprove of but not completely writing off their humanity 
Okay. Um, I think we are uh, unfortunately out of time. Sorry, Frankie. Um, but uh, please um, join me in um, thanking Sarah. Before you join me in thanking Sarah, um, Chris, we have an uh, email sheet up there. OK, I think we have uh, an email sheet. If you'd like to find out about future events such as this, we have um, three a semester, six a year. Uh, give us your email. The only times we will email you is when there is another event. Um, there are also uh, books for sale up there. Um, and now you can join me in thanking Sarah and thank all of you for coming tonight. <laughs>